This video has been supported by PCBWay. Hey guys, I always thought that at CERN, the largest particle physics laboratory in the world, they were only trying to create black holes or to open a portal to a new dimension with carbon straws or something. But as it turns out, their scientists are really involved with much darker magic. Last year they have released as an open source hardware project a very promising analog to digital converter featuring precise temperature control, an LTZ1000 and Vichet's finest thin film resistors straight from the arcanery. It will be at the heart of the Large Hadron Collider's high luminosity upgrade, measuring kiloampere magnet currents with sub-PPM accuracies. That's quite a distinguished position already, but tell you what, today we are going to build one. And if it lives up to its reputation, I'm going to award it the highest honor in the electrometrology field, a permanent spot on my bench. These ADCs have not been designed to compete with existing 8.5 digit multimeters. They literally only digitize voltages between plus and minus 10 volt. But most of their preliminary specifications, noise and temperature coefficient in particular, happen to be much better than those of my previous champions. So I think this will be a very interesting addition to my test equipment skyscrapers. The aptly named HPM7177 project caught my eye because of an EEV block forum thread, where the creator himself was shedding light on some of the more advanced design decisions. Really cool. I also love the fact that this design, except for a handful of custom resistors, uses only off-the-shelf components, meaning that everybody with a bit of determination could replicate it. Personally, what I'm going to do is... Say it, come on. There's no way around it anymore. I guess I'm going to replicate it then. Uh, by swapping around the LTZ supporting precision resistors a little bit. I want R11 and R13 to be right next to each other. So that I could use two separate resistors or a network like this diagonally across the two, which is cheaper and has much better ratio stability. But let's not get ahead of ourselves too far. Here's a little overview. The power supply modules design files have not been released yet. There are Gerber files and a bill of materials so that you can build one. But some fine tuning and troubleshooting might be necessary on this preliminary version. Where other high end voltmeters use an unobtainium guarded shielded mains transformer, this module relies on a medical grade AC to DC converter brick. From there, a few more DC to DC converters generate the bipolar power supply rails that are needed elsewhere in the system. These integrated converters are huge time savers, and their medical grade isolation might even give us some common mode immunity. But at the end of the day, they are evil, noisy switches. Which is why at the top right corners there are some buffered RC low pass filters going right into 78 and 79 series linear regulators. We've looked at their rather spectacular low noise performance in a previous video. In the bottom left corner there's an OP548 power op amp bolted to a heatsink that's controlled by another module and used to drive a Peltier cooler. That lucky bastard is going to live right here in the middle of a precision sandwich, making sure that the most sensitive module's temperature always stays the same. The main module is kind of a motherboard with multiple functions. It interfaces with the outside world via optical isolation. It gives this outsourced FPGA board a place to sit and lets it control everything. And it is in charge of the analog mezzanine board temperature. It senses it with a sophisticated self-cal capable circuit and a remote PT1000 sensor. That is located right here on the central analog mezzanine board itself next to the 32-bit Delta Sigma ADC. So basically, since there's an integrated AD7177 chip at the heart of it all, doing the actual analog to digital conversion, doesn't that mean that this entire project is just smoke and mirrors? Haha, <laughs> got him. Nah, not really. The AD7177 is a fantastic ADC for sure. But CERN is taking it to the next level by substituting its internal voltage reference with a world-class DC voltage standard almost. Every little detail is going to contribute to the stellar performance of this system. It's getting a low noise power supply, 
copious amounts of shielding and probably the most temperature invariant environment feasible in such a small enclosure. It's getting rudimentary self-cal and auto-zero capabilities as well. And the analog input can be detached and shorted to ground completely to not interfere with these operations. That's quite dangerous actually for unbuffered voltage sources. Alright, let's get started with this unusual assortment of items. This is a stainless steel gastronorm container, also known as a hotel pan. It's kind of a trough for humans. I've covered it with a high temperature glass pane. And I'm going to give that a better seal with a high temperature silicone rubber. After mixing this stuff needs a quick exorcism. Then I'm just pouring by eye and hoping that gravity will do its thing and smooth it out a bit. I'm not looking for a perfect high pressure or high vacuum seal. As a matter of fact I only want to prevent some very expensive fumes from escaping. The actual vapor pressure I expect in that chamber is going to be negligible. And any ideas what this could be? You have time to consider until the silicone sets then you'll see it in action. Most of the boards and stencils I'm going to use were sponsored by PCBWay, who has always been a great partner in both professional and playful projects. And these boards today are no exception of course, they all came out beautifully. I think this back plane is the largest PCB I ever ordered. It doesn't have particularly difficult features or anything, but it needs perfect dimensional accuracy to fit inside an existing standardized 19 inch subrack system. Which it does by the way, expect intense satisfaction when we get to that part. Other than that it just distributes power through press fit connectors. To these modules which also have to comply with IEC 60297. That's where the popular 100 by 160 mm Euro card format comes from. The centering and the silk screen printing on these first edition PCB way cards is absolutely impeccable, guaranteed to fetch a 10 rating from the PSA. This is the 4 layer main module with features small enough for me to want a solder paste stencil. It's mostly digital but in the bottom right corner there's going to be some precision analog circuitry. For that it's very important that the PCB laminate is as flat as this. Otherwise if you solder a high end SMD component to a bulging board and afterwards force it flat by bolting it to something, you can put a lot of force on component legs and create a very difficult to troubleshoot problem. Huh? Why do my readings depend on the tightness of this bolt? It makes no sense. Not a quote from myself of course, because these PCB ways are nearly perfect. This is the so called grounding board, it's not much more than a plated hole. It will be mounted directly on the analog input connector, providing a single contact point between circuit ground and chassis, also known as protective earth. And this we can call a happy little accident, where I didn't give them the drill file for whatever reason. Hmm. Ah yes, just as I thought. Alright, let's begin with the main board. I've surrounded it with other PCBs so that the stencil doesn't bulge. Because I'm relying on an experimental $50 at home setup and not a professional few hundred thousand dollar SMT assembly line, I don't feel too bad about cheating with a leaded T5 grade solder paste. T5 meaning smallest grain sizes and overall hardest to screw up. Normally I prefer using my mom's credit card for questionable applications like this. But nowadays, with biometric two-factor authentication and stuff, things are not so easy anymore. It just dawned on me that solder paste in a syringe is not a good idea at all. You have to dispense it somewhat correctly or waste the excess. Whereas from a little tub you could just take everything and put it back in when you're done. Nevertheless, ta-da! It's a little bit thick in a few places but I think T5 is going to fix itself. Now we are powering up the sugar fueled AI pick and place and inspection machine to distribute roughly $200 worth of components on this board alone. 
The overall bomb cost of this project is fairly high, at least when compared to other open source projects that we've built before. CERN, however, apparently needs about a hundred of these guys. And when looking at the alternative of buying a hundred brand new high performance multimeters, it makes perfect sense. Careful. Okay, time for the return of the bed pan. It's kind of important to put that on a somewhat temperature controlled heater. Because in there we are going to put this magic fluid, a perfluoropolyether, which will evaporate at 240 degrees C. Until then it's a wonderfully inert substance. But if for whatever reason we ever reach 290, it will break down releasing fluoride. And that in turn is only one little air moisture interaction away from becoming hydrofluoric acid. Not something I would like to generate in my living room. Well, honestly, I kinda do, but not right next to my precious HPM7177 boards. And certainly not in a metallic vessel. I'm putting boards on a little stand made from stainless welding rod, so that they are not swimming in the boiling golden fluid. I want them to be submerged only in the 240 degrees C vapor. That results in the most even and automatically overshoot proof heating action. And as a nice side effect, the vapor also displaces most of the atmosphere's oxygen. The materials for this chamber were significantly cheaper than the cheapest infrared reflow oven. Only the fluid is a little bit expensive, but it has a long shelf life and you hardly lose any if you wait for cool down before taking out the board. The only thing my vapor phase reflow oven doesn't do is follow a solder paste manufacturer's temperature profile. I think that could be accomplished by positioning the board higher or lower in the chamber. Oh well, maybe next time. When everything is nice and cooked through, I'm just putting the entire chamber pot on some kind of heat sink to accelerate the cool down. That looks cool already, don't you think? As far as I can tell, drops from the lid are the only reason for any of the precious fluid to get lost at all. If it wasn't for them, the boards would come out completely dry. This board came out beautifully, except for three tombstones and this little bridge, which should be easy to touch up. I'm not entirely sure what that brown dirt on the silk screen is, but my prime suspect is flux residue. I think the fluid might have a cleaning side effect, because some dirt is accumulating at the bottom of the tub too. Can I interest any of you gentlemen in some Marco Reps bathwater? All of these steps have to be repeated for all of the other boards. This one is going to be the analog mezzanine board, the most expensive and the most critical module. It's a six layer PCB, not necessarily for complexity's sake I suspect, just to have more metal for a more even temperature distribution across all of the sensitive components. For that purpose it will get an aluminium heat spreader too, and a Peltier cooler that can both heat and cool depending on what the ambient temperature requires. Now most of the parts in this modern design are SMD of course. But there are some prominent through-hole footprints still waiting for there, Feet, I guess? You may have caught a glimpse in the intro already. These feet are actually pretty big deals. For the best long-term stability, this circuit needs the best voltage reference in the world, of course. The LTZ1000A, about which we've talked before, and we will talk again soon in much greater detail, when we are building a 10 volt standard with one. To support and configure that part, of course we can use no less than the world's best resistors. And those are pretty much without competition from Vichy foil resistors. Whenever the lowest temperature coefficient and the best shelf and load life stabilities are needed, there is no way around their hermetically sealed VHP100 series. We are going to have another in-depth look at those two when talking about the resistance standards for the Fluke calibrator. 
We also got some incredible military grade PRND 1446 resistor networks. I've taken to calling them the golden boys because just visually they are absolutely stunning, don't you think? Marco, would you marry me? <gasps> oh my god, darling, are those military grade PRND 1446 resistor networks? You shouldn't have. The golden boys are a lot more than just good looking though. They contain eight of these discrete thin film resistor chips, all factory trimmable to custom values, hermetically sealed and thermally coupled to one another by an alumina ceramic package for that oh so precious ratio stability. Really powerful parts here. The HPM uses two of them. One to set the reference buffer gain and turn the LTZ output into 5 and 10 volt. The other one to set the fully differential input stage gain and attenuate the input voltage a little bit. Before proceeding with the assembly I'm going to have to interject a little bit of CNC action. I want to bolt down a heat spreader into its final position and press the most important components against it before soldering them. That way I hope to get the best thermal interfaces with little to no air gaps. I haven't really shown a whole lot of CNC work lately, but I hope the landscape of chips in the background and the quality of this part when it's done will convince you that I've been practicing a lot. This project loves M2.5 threads. My first heat spreader attempt with which this scene started is now scrap because I accidentally gave it M3. Alright, hold on to your PPMs because here's the result. I made this part 1mm taller than it's meant to be according to the plans. That will require small changes in other mechanical parts like the front panel too. But I think it's worth the trouble, because this way I'll have enough space to mount the most critical LTZ resistor, that temperature configuration 1K-12K divider right underneath the heat spreader. Its less critical and more environmentally immune colleagues can live on the other side of the board as they were meant to. It's a bit blasphemic to mount godlike components like these in sockets. But I found a fancy gold-plated copper pinned 6 USD per piece dip socket. With that I think the advantages just win. For example less thermal stress through soldering and an absolutely effortless disassembly should I want to test any homemade golden boy alternatives in the future. Who knows. I'm soldering pins in a random order to not put too much heat into one spot at a time. And here's the gang of less critical but still very fancy VHP 101 resistors for the bottom of the board. Same rules apply. Heat should only go into the solder joint and not into the resistor where it can cause semi-permanent hysteresis. And that was pretty much all that was interesting about the assembly side of things. Let's fast forward through the rest. On the main module and the power supply there are some unusual status LEDs. With rubber lenses, an unreasonably high price tag and an impossible to hand solder footprint. Not a fan of those, but they survived vapor phase reflow soldering alright. To insulate the mezzanine board thermally a bit and to keep the Peltier from working too hard, it gets a plastic baffle. That would be an ideal candidate for 3D printing. But I'm glad that I went with CNC machining Delrin. What an absolute dream of a material to work with. One just has to resist the urge to eat the yellow snow. On its other side the thermoelectric cooler needs a heat or a cold sink depending on configuration. That needs some flat surfaces for mounting screws to sit on. Let me tell you I was not looking forward to this operation. Milling straight down into the cooling fins. On a scale from 1 to rocket launch I was expecting surface of the sun levels of loud. But no, it turned out to be perfectly tolerable. No touch, only look. A couple of beautiful Lemo connectors arrived a bit late to the party, but of course they are very welcome nevertheless. 
By the way, if you're a company and so far you've purchased your Lemo connectors from the larger electronic distributors, try ordering from the manufacturer directly someday. You'll be pleasantly surprised. The grounding board is trippy enough on its own. I think I can assemble it without magic vapors. What I am going to use though is this adorable little USB-C hotplate by Miniware. These spring contacts exist to make a good electrical connection with their front panel. Unfortunately, the front panels I got, as a part of these pre-made enclosure kits, are made from anodized aluminium. So they have a non-conductive outer layer which has to be etched away with sodium hydroxide. Or an angle grinder if you want to be that guy. These subrack cassette style enclosures are pretty cool. I only had to see and see drill the status LED holes in the front panel. Everything else about them is strictly standardized so that they'll fit into your system automatically if your subrack enclosure and your PCBs comply with the same standards. What the hell? Maybe the manual could use some standardization too. Page 1? Page 2 is the very last one? Page 3 is in position of page 2? But it needs a 180 degree rotation of the whole pamphlet. Uh, I think we are on our own. Can't be that hard, can it? Okay, step one. Take this piece and break it into two halves. <laughs> step two. Take this tool with the word top facing towards us. And insert the broken in half thing with the word bottom on it. Now we only have to align the tool, top facing towards us, with the bottom rear corner of a PCB and bolt the metal bit squarely behind the back plane connector. The other side works the same, only with every occurrence of top and bottom inverted. These guys will lock the boards in their cassettes and prevent them from sliding around. Kinda makes me want to get back into modular synthesizers this stuff. Pretty good, huh? The front panel still needs some color and labels for the LEDs. And the top and bottom walls are supposed to be perforated, but eh, not today. Assembly of the main module is pretty much the same, except for a few extra dabs of T5 grade thermal paste. Oh, now that you mention it, at the time I'm making this video, the soft... the heart? The programming of that FPGA board has not yet been released. Generally, I'd love to learn enough about Xilinx FPGAs to be able to DIY that. But for the time being, I'm going to use a minimal functioning bin file that the creator has kindly sent me. That is going to put out raw, uncalibrated 32-bit ADC counts at a fixed 10 kHz sample rate via USB and fiber. Later, the FPGA should be able to handle the counts to volt conversion and a few other math functions subconsciously. For now, we'll have to do all of that in software, I'm afraid. Now, earlier I promised some intense satisfaction, didn't I? This is an affordable 19-inch desktop enclosure from a German online shop called Reichelt. The back plane in the rear has been designed by someone at CERN and it fits in there perfectly without modifications. The cassette modules and the guide rails are from yet another third party. And all of it can be assembled effortlessly by this random German guy. I uh, kind of started stripping the front panels anodizing with sodium hydroxide. That came out a bit ugly, didn't it? But don't let it distract you from the intense satisfaction. Huh? What do you think? No? How about a second pair of power supply and main module for symmetry's sake? Better? 
Well, I do concede I'll have to do something with the front panels. But right now, I didn't want to add lengthy anodizing experiments to this already long video. For now, let's turn this thing on, let it settle for a few days, and see how it does. In the meantime, we can have a quick look at the Raspberry Pi software, that is capable of buffering and working with 32-bit numbers, while they come barreling in through two USB ports at 10 kHz each. First of all, I wanted to try and capture something on my more powerful Windows desktop machine. To make sure that at almost one megabaud things can work, before moving to the Raspberry Pi where we might encounter other bottlenecks. These are the raw ADC counts being interpreted as characters. Because of the open input connector, the least significant bits will all be noise. Sometimes they happen to form control characters, like new line or bell, which occasionally makes the Windows warning sound ping. Next, here's the data interpreted correctly as 32-bit numbers. Since we are projecting an input voltage range of minus 10 to 10 volt onto the range of 32-bit numbers, it makes perfect sense that with no input, we are getting readings smack dab in the middle. Next, I'm going to plug in a long short circuit and write a few seconds worth of readings into a CSV file. With Python, Pandas and Plotly, one can very easily turn such a huge amount of data into expressive statistics. For now, I'm just going to copy the mean value and subtract it from all future readings. That way, at 0 volt, we are going to get approximately 0 counts. Now, from an undisclosed source, which may or may not be the next video's subject, I'm going to take a super stable 10 volt. And I'm going to use the mean value again to find out about the ADC gain, what do you mean? which in turn finally lets me translate counts to volt. And there we have it, our first crude calibration and our first actual voltage readings and statistics. Unfortunately, a 27 microvolt standard deviation is not that great. With Bryman's new BM789 for example, I'm always getting a standard deviation of zero. Or a lying deviation in some cases. <laughs> Luckily, there's something simple we can do to improve that number for the HPM7177. Let's try to do that on a Raspberry Pi 4B with my existing multi-instrumentalist data logging software. Of course, the readings are so noisy because we are still using the native 10 kHz sample rate. That's 0.1 millisecond per sample. Solartron 7081, for example, helps itself to almost a minute per reading. Let's see what happens if we average over a few samples. I had to try a few different strategies to simultaneously read two USB serial ports at almost one megabaud each without them getting in each other's ways. If you want to see my final multi-processing solution, the whole project is on GitHub. Here are a few results. The first segment is at native 10 kilo readings per second. In the second segment we are averaging over 100 samples to get one reading. In the third segment we are averaging over 10,000 samples to get one reading per second. That's about as good as it gets, I think. I also tried one reading every 10 seconds, but that brought no huge improvement. Anyways, we are getting less than 0.1 ppm peak-to-peak -peak noise with this mysterious voltage reference. Pretty damn good. But what about the most prestigious voltmeter characteristic, linearity? Well, let's find out. Our primitive two-point calibration from earlier remains. I'm controlling the calibrator remotely, making it sweep from minus 10 to 10 volt in half volt steps, while recording ADC readings and their deviation from the nominal calibrator value in ppm of range. And here are the results, nicely presented by Grafana, straight from the database. Looks like the deviation is especially low in three points. Two of them may sound familiar. Our old friends 0 and 10 volt, what a surprise. The shape of that curve may also look familiar to those who have done their homework. We got a very similar result to the one in the preliminary CERN report. For them, the design requirement was less than 1 ppm non-linearity and only for positive voltages, so their job is done here. And I too am very satisfied with this result, because I managed to defeat my old voltmeters in every discipline. But there are much better voltmeters out there, whose legendary DCV linearity is still undefeated. 
So what do you think? Why don't we cheat again and see where that gets us? I ran another one of these voltage sweeps, but with finer steps this time. And I went back to recording raw ADC counts to a CSV file. I'm sorry for the repeated eye violation. Back when I recorded this I didn't know Jupiter Lab had a dark theme. Um, anyways, I'm importing all the data to split it into lists. One list of more or less known reference voltages, the ones I've set the calibrator to. And at least one list of ADC counts corresponding to those voltages. I'm feeding those lists into a method called NumPy Polyfit, which will attempt to find the closest polynomial function that turns one list into the other. That is much more powerful than our crude two-point calibration from earlier. The third parameter which I've set to 10 in this case is called degree. One could explain it as degrees of freedom, amount of power you're giving that function, or number of terms you're getting back. Well, the rest is obvious. I'm creating a new polynomial function with those 10 terms I just got, feed in some raw ADC counts and have it create the most beautiful voltage readings. I'll just copy over those terms to my data logging software and replicate the same thing there. This is a very useful method for almost every sensor to digital conversion that you'd like to be more accurate. But unfortunately it isn't almighty. The higher the degree, the more wiggly a function gets and the more processing power it needs. On the Raspberry Pi we still have some headroom, but I'm not sure how much of this we can squeeze into the internal FPGA. While an external computer has to do this, I would call it cheating. I could do the same thing for Advantist R6581T and it wouldn't make that a more linear multimeter. As soon as the voltmeter is able to do it internally, I think it's fair. Most importantly though, this method needs a reliable reference. Right now I've fine-tuned the HPM7177 to be exactly as linear as the deck in my Fluke calibrator. But how linear is that in the grand scheme of things? I need a few minutes alone with the world's most linear DC voltmeter, but in the absence of contradicting proof I'm going to claim that we've almost made it to 0.1 ppm integral linearity. And even if it's a bit more, it's a spectacular result. Huge compliments to Nikolai at CERN for designing this, and huge thanks for making it open source. I'm going to post another update when I'm more confident in these linearity figures and when I've collected some more long-term data. On a completely unrelated note, I would like to extend to you an invitation to Keysight um, University Live. It's a much anticipated free online event where you can not only learn about the freshest test gear tips and tricks, but also win some out of over a hundred mostly matte black prizes like this cute little fellow or its ever so slightly bigger brother. Two of these beauties will be winnable, among more than $300,000 worth of test equipment overall. There will be live winner drawings, a launch of a secret new line of benchtop devices and a chat with the engineering team behind those new devices. Since you've made it this far in my not always quite so serious video, I think you will enjoy the overall laid back atmosphere of that show as much as I do. So sign up now with the link below for an early bird entry. I'm wishing you a lot of luck and if you happen to win an EXR254A that you don't need, let me know, I'll gladly help with an environmentally friendly disposal. And that's all for today, thank you for watching.